Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Are you a candidate for divine revelation? What does that mean? When God looks at you, and by the way, every person, God is continuously evaluating us. He knows our thoughts, he knows our desires, and he knows everything that we do. And the question that we have to answer is this. If God were to give us revelation, that is, guidance from a spiritual standpoint, to sow within our life his truth, to give us heavenly perspective, would we be someone who would take that and properly apply it to our life, that we would do his purposes, that we would walk in his will, and that we would manifest his glory? Are those things of an interest to us? Now, we could ask that a different way. We could simply ask, are you his disciple? Because a disciple wants to learn in order that they can implement that into their life so that they can accomplish the will of their teacher. In Hebrew, their rabbi, in order that they fulfill his purposes, that they manifest his character in their life. So ask yourself again, are you truly a candidate for revelation? Would God want to invest in you because he knows that you are going to produce good fruit? Well, with that said, take out your Bible and look with me to the Gospel of Matthew and Matthew chapter 13. The book of Matthew in chapter 13. At the end of last week's study, we saw that Messiah, he was encountering his family, his mother, his brothers and sisters, and he made a very significant statement. He, he stretched forth his hand, and he pointed to his disciples, and he said, these are my mother and my brothers and my sisters. Who was he referring to? Those who would learn and then implement that in their behavior. Now, I say all the time, a person is not saved by behavior. But having been saved, having experienced the regeneration from the Holy Spirit, having become a new creation in Christ, there's no doubt that we're supposed to obey and behave differently. That's what John the Baptist meant when he said, to bear fruit worthy of repentance. So in this passage of Scripture, we see that Messiah, he's going to challenge those who are listening to him. And my hope is that you and I also are challenged by this and that we pass the tests, that we take hold of that challenge and that we are indeed a good candidate to be a recipient of his revelation, that he would look at us and see someone that he desires to invest in, to guide us, to direct us, to give us his heavenly perspective for one reason, that we would produce much fruit. Matthew chapter 13, verse 1. We read here, and on that day. Now, some translations will say on that same day, and it probably is that same day. But the literal translation is on that day. And usually in the New Covenant, when we encounter that phrase, that day, it's speaking about something that's going to take place. 
oftentimes an opportunity. So ask yourself, am I someone that when God presents me with a opportunity, a spiritual opportunity to, to respond in a way that would be pleasing to him, that would accomplish his purpose, that would be in his will, that would bring glory and honor to him, that would testify to others that he is indeed the Lord of my life. Do we respond? So we read here, and on that day, Yeshua, that is Jesus of Nazareth, Yeshua went forth from the house, this was his house, and he sat along the sea. And obviously, this sea that we're speaking about is the Sea of Galilee, referred to today in, in Israel as the Canaret. So he's there at that significant location, exactly where the prophet Isaiah says that the revelation. He uses the term light, that the light would begin to shine. And what happens? Well, let's press on. We read that uh, he went there by the Sea of Galilee near his home and many crowds, and that's exactly what it says. Not just a large crowd, but many crowds, and the implication is many different crowds were assembled unto him. So many crowds, they were assembled to him so that he did something. He embarked into the boat and he sat down. And all the crowd upon the shore, they were standing. Now pay attention to that last phrase in the Greek language. It's just one word. They were standing. But here's what's important. It's in a unique grammatical construction. And that is called in Greek the pluperfect. And what is it referring to? Well, this grammatical construction always shows distance. I use the term that which is remote. And even though that Messiah was on the boat and it was close to the shore and they were standing there so that they could all hear his teaching, realize something. That crowd in and of themselves, even though that they were physically close, they were far away spiritually. And why was that? Well, he's going to give them the reason why. Because once more, he's going to relate biblical truth through a parable. I want to say again, a parable is a statement, usually a story, an illustration but it comes from a word in the Hebrew origin, which means to govern or to rule your life. And if we're wise, if we're going to be pleasing to him, then his parables that he taught so frequently need to govern our life. His truth needs to rule. They need to have lordship over us. So once more, this group was standing by the, the seashore in front of him. And what happened? Well, we see here that he began to speak to them. And here it is in many parables saying, behold, the sower went out to sow. Now, planting seeds were, were done differently at that time than it is today. Because people wouldn't plant seeds, they would cast seeds, they would sprinkle them, throw them upon the ground, and then let nature take its course. And what would happen? Well, he knows and he's going to teach us as well. We read in this passage that the sower went out to sow, and in his sowing, some fell upon the way. Now, this would have been how people traveled. That is the road, the pathway that they traveled upon. And that means that the seeds were vulnerable. And we notice that right away because we are told in the middle of verse 4, the birds came and devoured them. But there's going to be given another situation. 
Not only did these seeds fall upon the way, but we're going to see that they're going to fall in another location, but some fell upon the rocks, meaning the rocky soil. And we learn from that where there is not much land, and immediately, because there was not much land, immediately they sprang up because there was no depth to the soil. And what would happen? Well, we keep reading. Look at verse 6. And the sun went up and they were scorched, meaning these seeds, because there was no soil for them. They sprung up, but they were extremely vulnerable, and the sun scorched them, and because they had no root, they withered. They were withered, and the implication is in a very quick manner. Look now to verse 7. But some fell among the thorns. And it says, they grew, but the thorns also, meaning the thorns also grew, and what happened? These thorns pierced. It says literally, these thorns choked them, and therefore they too would not produce any fruit. So we have, at this time, three possibilities. Upon the way, upon the rock, and among the thorns. And what we find here is that the majority of this seed didn't produce much fruit. There wasn't a positive outcome. And that tells us something. For most individuals, they are not going to be fruitful. They are not going to have a life that bears what the sower, and he's the sower, what his expectations are. Keep reading. Look, if you would, to verse 8. But some fell upon, and here's the key, the good land. Now realize something. This word good, and I teach this frequently, has to do with the will of God. So intrinsically in this parable, not only is Messiah saying that this is good land, but what makes it good is that this land is connected to the will of God. There is an inherent relationship between the land and the will of God. Now, we see that frequently in the scriptures in regard to Israel. But we need to make it personal. What about you and me? Are we intrinsically connected? We have a desire. We are committed to the will of God. If we're not, then we're not good land. We're not the soil that this seed is going to take good root in so that it can produce much fruit. So he's telling us here, if we are a disciple, if we are part of the family of God, if we are individuals that are a candidate to receive revelation from him, then we need to be interested, and here's the key, in the will of God. Once more, verse 8, but some fell upon the good land. And it was giving fruit. And the implication is that it did so not just sporadically, but it was giving and giving and giving good fruit. And it did so a hundredfold, sixtyfold, and thirtyfold. And then notice how this, this parable ends. A very significant statement. He simply says, The one having an ear, let him hear. Now, that should be familiar to us. Why? Well, if you are a student of the book of Revelation, we know something. In chapters 2 and 3, there are those seven messages to seven congregations, believing congregations. And he concludes each of these seven messages to these seven congregations with a statement. A statement that God expects us to be overcomers, to have victory in our life, meaning that we are supposed to accomplish his will. And then he says, and he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says. Also, in the book of Revelation, later on in chapter 13, 
we see that the enemy, I'm speaking about that, that antichrist empire in the last days, he is going to, the scripture emphatically says this, he is going to make war with the saints and temporarily overcome us. And then he says, to those who have an ear, let him hear. Whenever he says that, he's not speaking to the masses. That phrase is a literary device that tells us that this is directed to believers, to the congregation of the redeemed, those who are truly his disciples. Let's move on to, to verse verse 10. The disciples, notice the disciples, no one else, but it was the disciples who heard this parable, and what did they do? They responded. They wanted to hear more. They wanted to understand its significance. And before he goes into it, notice what he says to them. The disciples came to him, and they said to him, why? Meaning, for what reason that in parables you speak to them? Why do you teach them in parables? And notice that he answered and said to them, because unto you it was given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Now, pay attention to that. He says to his disciples, and this is true, not just for those disciples that walk with him and live with him and witness his ministry, some almost 2,000 years ago, but we're speaking about disciples in the broadest sense, meaning you and me. This is the implication. It is given to us to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. And God will sow that truth. He will give us this revelation if we are his disciples. And, and notice that he wants us to understand things in abundance. Look again. He says, to you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to those it is not given. Who are those? Those who are that, that soil that's on the way, that rocky soil, that soil that's in the midst of, of thorns. They are not going to be given. He says emphatically, look again, verse, verse 11 at the end, but to them it has not been given, verse 12. For to ever has, it will be given to him and in abundance it's going to be given. But to whoever who does not have, even what he does have, it will be removed from him. So you may have a little spiritual knowledge, but if you're not committed to the will of God, then what you do have is going to be taken away from you from an understanding perspective. You're not going to be growing in the faith. You're not going to be growing in a right perspective. Now, why does he do this? Why is he saying these things? Because this is serious. Because this is of the utmost importance. What's the subject? What it almost always is. The kingdom of heaven. And if you are a candidate for revelation, you are going to be the recipient. He is going to teach you through his word, by means of his Holy Spirit, he is going to teach you the mysteries of of the kingdom of heaven. Look now to, to verse, verse 12 once more. To those who have, it is going to be given in abundance. But to whoever who does not have, it's going to be removed from him. Verse 13. On account of this, Messiah is still speaking. On account of this, in parables, I speak to them that seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear nor understand. Now, why is that? Because he doesn't want a partial commitment. You say, how can you be so sure 
of that. Because we know something. He is going to put every individual, whether they be Jewish or Gentile, makes no difference. He is going to put every individual. We're going to come to Matthew 25, and there's going to be the teaching of the sheep and the goats. Nothing in between. And in the book of Revelation, again, to those seven congregations, to one he writes, I wish that you were either hot or cold. See, those who are committed, they are going to reap the benefit of their commitment. Those who are against, they are going to reap the outcome of their, their commitment against him. But those who are lukewarm, those are the ones that he's going to spit from his mouth because they simply aren't interested. So in some ways, what he's talking about, those who have they have a little bit of commitment. They have a little bit of spiritual knowledge. But we're going to see something. We're going to see, and I can give examples of this, individuals that they understood the gospel. They would study the word of God, but they wouldn't make a true commitment. And after a, a period of time, they, they changed. I mean, they could understand some of it, but what they had... <laughs> was taken away. And now they are embracing all types of heresies and false teachings. So that's why it doesn't surprise me. When someone claims to be a believer, and I emphasize that, claims, but then they deny their faith. And they start embracing things that are contrary to the scripture of God. This is what we're seeing here. What they do have, and we're not talking about salvation, we're talking about a little bit of knowledge. A, a false commitment, a false, a false proclamation or profession. He says, what they have will be taken away from them. Why? On account of this, he spoke in parables, that they would see but, but not see. They would be hearing but, but not hear nor understand. And then he says, all of this is prophetic. Isn't it interesting? How many times... Messiah turns back to prophecy. And here he's going to quote the prophet Isaiah. Everything, and I want to emphasize that, everything that Messiah said, the basis for it is found in the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, and especially, especially in the prophets. So he says here, look again, verse 14, and shall be fulfilled upon them, not upon the disciples, but upon them, the prophecy of, of, of Isaiah, which he says, hearing you hear, but you do not understand. And seeing you see, but you do not perceive. Now, this is important because he speaks about seeing. They see things, but they don't have perception. They don't have that revelation that ties things together in a way that we can understand just what we mentioned earlier, the things of God, the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But when we have a true commitment, when we are people who are interested, and don't forget this, in the will of God, realize something. Messiah, His Spirit, the Holy Spirit, He is going to invest in our life. And we're going to see God the Father is glorified. God the Son, His ministry is going to be, be working out through us. And the Holy Spirit, He is going to be empowering us, enlightening us, guiding us so that we can be fruitful and produce that hundredfold, naughtyfold, sixtyfold, thirtyfold. He wants us to be individuals that are fruitful. But those who do not have a commitment, those who are not interested in the will of God, what does he say here? He says they will not perceive for, notice why, for their heart has been made dull. It was made dull by what? The things of this world, by the things that are not connected to the will of God. And when we're not interested in the will of God, our hearts will grow hard and dull. For the hearts of this people are dull and their ears have become difficult meaning difficult to penetrate 
with truth. And their eyes, their eyes are closed. Why? This all happens because of rejection of the things of God. They were given, but it didn't produce. They are that, that, that soil on the road. They are that rocky soil, that thorny soil that is, is devoured, that is choked out, or that is, is scorched and withers up. So this is what he's saying. And look on. He writes in this last part. He says, lest they see with their eyes and their, with their ears they hear and with their hearts understand and turn and I will heal them. Right? Should heal them. He's saying here, this is not going to happen. Why isn't it? A lack of a true commitment. If they made a profession, it was a false profession. They're not interested in the things of God. And therefore, their eyes, their heart, their ears, all of this will go through a process. And here's what he's teaching us. When a person is not committed, God gives revelation and they don't respond to it. What's the outcome? Their heart grows dull when God gives us insight illumination light through the Holy Spirit of truth he sheds light upon his word and we don't uh, respond to it our eyes are going to slowly but surely be closed and our our he ears will become difficult to penetrate see all of this comes about when what when we are not people who want to take truth and implement it into our life so that God's will is done, His name is glorified, and His purposes are fulfilled. And when we are individuals that are all about our will and think that God's there to get our will accomplished, we have been deceived. And that type of, of, of mindset is going to cause you to see things dimly, to not perceive things properly, and to have a heart that becomes petrified. In other words, what the Word of God is telling us here is that if we want to be people who produce much fruit, we have to be God-fearing disciples. Well, I'll close with that. Shalom. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.